Code Talker by Joseph Bruchet. Chapter 12, Learning the Code. That first day in class, Johnny Manolito emphasized to us how important our jobs as code talkers would be. The lives of many men, he said, will depend on your messages. You have to get it right the first time, every time. Because of its great value, no one was ever to be told about the code. Nothing I wrote down in that room could ever be taken from the room. It all had to be kept stored in only one place, in my head. That was why everything put on the blackboards was quickly erased. Every scrap of paper we wrote on was collected at the end of each day. If I breathed the word about the very existence of the code to an outsider, even to another Navajo Marine who is not a code talker, I could be placed in the brig for the rest of the war. I've heard it said that we Navajos carried code books with us. That is not so. Some code books were printed, were printed up, but they were kept closely guarded. The only two places in the whole wor world where they were used were our training areas at Pearl Harbor and Camp Elliott. The code went with us everywhere, but only in our memories. If you are captured in battle, John Benelli said, die before telling the enemy anything about the code. Even if they beat you, even if bamboo splinters are shoved under your fingernails, you must keep quiet about our secrets. I will never tell the enemy. I wrote those words down on my paper and underlined them twice. John Benelli's warning did not frighten me. It made me proud that our sacred language was so important to America. It felt good to know that we were the only ones who could do this useful thing. We swore that we would protect the code with our lives, and we kept our word. I am not sure how many of us became Navajo code talkers during World War II, but I know that it was close to 400 men. While it remained classified, not one of us ever told about the code, not even to our families. We kept it secret throughout the war and long after. How did we make the code work? In fact, grandchildren, it was not hard. First of all, we had to learn a new alphabet. For every letter in the English alphabet, a Navajo word was assigned. Wallachi or Ants, the very nickname that Hosteen Mitchell gave me, was the first alphabet word in our code. That coincidence seemed to me to be a sign that the way of code talking was something I was meant to do, and that I would do well at it. Bish Dutzis, which is zinc, was the last. One of our jobs of our second class of Navajo code talkers was to assign more Navajo words to the letters of the English alphabet that are used, are used most often. That is because people who break code can sometimes do so by hearing or seeing the same sound or symbol appearing many times. They call, it, they call this word frequency. So we added 17 more Navajo words for A E I O U D H L N R S N T. The most commonly used of those letters got more than one new word. A became not just Wallachi for ants, but also Bilasana for apple and Cisnit for axe. Because it would take far too long to spell out every word that we sent, we only used this alphabet for words that were not used a lot. On Sulphur Island, for example, we spelled out the mountain name Suribachi by sending the Navajo words for sheep, uncle, ram, ice, bear, ant, cat, horse, itch. We used separate code words for things often mentioned in warfare. There were so many words like that, which I had to memorize, hundreds of them. Tutsu, whale, was battleship. Jenny, chicken hawk, was dive bomber. Namasi, potato, was grenade. Sonaki, two star, was major general. Every night I went to bed in our barracks, whispering those words to myself. Each day I was tested in the classroom and taught more words. I did this week after week until the code became as much a part of me as my mouth, my eyes, and my ears. It was not easy but I was proud to be doing something that only Navajo could do. They did try having some young white men learn our code. 
Major Shannon, another of the Marines who was recruiting Navajos, had been a Bureau of Indian Affairs school principal before he became a, a Marine. He was convinced that whatever a Navajo could do, a white man could do better. He found three young white men who were the sons of Indian traders. Major Shannon wrote a letter saying they spoke fluent Navajo and insisting they should immediately be made sergeants and given the job of telling the Navajo code talkers what to do. The Marine Corps, however, said those three white men had to go through basic training and start as privates. They would have to prove they were as good as they said they were not. When it came to things like saying hello and sugar, they did pretty well, but they could not carry on a real conversation. They could not even pronounce many Navajo words right. They were quickly removed from code school and assigned to the ordinary Marines. Camp Elliott was not all work. Once we began to master the code, we began to have fun. During the last two weeks, we were taught such things as how to use and repair our signal equipment. All of our instructors were white Marines who were patient and friendly with us. Because we liked them, we began to play tricks on them and tease them. Even though the Morse code class he taught was so boring that it made us want to go to sleep, Corporal Radden was the teacher we liked best, but we drove him crazy. What did we do to him? One of the things we did was to practice our weapons drills whenever we had a break in his class. The first rifles we had been issued were old Springfield .03SE. Like good Marines, we took them with us to our Morse code classes with bayonet sticks. Those bayonets were big knives with 14-inch long blades. Whenever the smoking lamp was lit, which meant anyone who wanted to take a break could do so, my friends and I would pick up our rifles and practice bayonet fighting with them. Ah, oh, it was great fun. The fact that we nicked each other now and then and also completely destroyed those old Springfields while we were doing it made it even better. We whooped and hollered and made as much noise as we fenced with our rifles that Corporal Rayant finally told us to do our bayonet practice outside. And just to let him know that we were really training hard, every now and then one of us would shove a bayonet through the wall of the tent near wherever he had taken refuge. Sadly, we had to end our fencing matches when we were issued new M1 rifles. The armory sergeant looked down at me sternly as he collected what was left of my Springfield. Begay, he said, you get even so much of the scratch on this here new M1, a big chunk of cash is going to be docked from your pay. However, we quickly came up with a new game to keep Corporal Radin's life interesting. Instead of bayonet drill, we started doing hand-to-hand -hand combat during our breaks. Because we had been told by our instructors that a Marine must always be ready to counter an attack, we included our friend Corporal Radin whenever we could. Anytime he dared step outside the tent for a smoke, he found himself wrestled to the ground by a pile of screaming Navajos. At the end of our time with Corporal Radin, he said that he had something he wanted to tell us. Because of you, he said in a voice, in a serious voice, I have lost my temper, my health, my good disposition, and my faith in my fellow man, some men in particular. He looked right at me. I looked back at him, widened my eyes, and then crossed them. Corporal Radin began to laugh. I'm really going to miss you, Indian. Those weeks at Camp Elliott were some of the best in my life. Much hardship and pain and sadness lay ahead of me. But during those weeks, as we prepared for war, I felt at peace. For so many years, I had been in schools where I was told never to speak our sacred language. I had to listen to the words of Billy Ghana teachers who had no respect at all for our old ways. And who told us that the best thing we could do would be to forget everything that made us Navajos. Now, practically overnight, that had all changed. Because it was important for us to speak, to speak Navajo, we used it with each other much of the time. Unlike at the schools back on the reservation, we were not forced to speak only English. Sometimes as we chatted with each other in Navajo, the other non-Navajos would look at us, wondering if we were talking about them, but no one ever told us to stop. We were supposed to speak our sacred language here. It felt so good to do this 
that sometimes it made me want to shout with happiness. It is so good, Henry Boss said to me one day near the end of our training. I nodded. Those words of those few words of his said it all. It was so good. It was good to have our language respected in this way. It was good to be here in this way. It was good that we could do something no one but another Navajo could do. Knowing our own language and culture could save the lives of Americans we had never met and help defeat enemies we want, who wanted to destroy us. I think that all of us felt the same way. I could tell by the smiles on their faces, the laughter we shared, and the seriousness with which my fellow code talkers approached our work. Our hearts felt full as we studied the code, took apart and repaired radios in the field, and learned how to fight with our weapons. We were proud to be Marines, and even prouder of the role that we had been chosen to play. Now, grandchildren, when I say we were proud, I do not mean that we became self-important. We did not go around thinking we were better than anyone else. We did not boast. Our pride was quiet and humble. We remembered that the language that now could be of such great use, our sacred language, had been passed down to us by our elders. We kept our elders and our families in mind as we studied. We remembered our sacred land. Each morning, I thought of my home and my family. I stood facing the rising sun. I took corn pollen from the pouch I always carried at my waist, touched it to my tongue and the top of my head, and then lifted it up to the four sacred directions as I greeted the dawn. That pouch stayed with me wherever I went during the war. The blessing of that corn pollen helped keep me calm and balanced and safe. Near the end of our training, we decided to have a special Navajo dance at Camp Elliott to show our appreciation to those who had taught us so much. We always wanted to do something special for our non-Indian buddies who were doing through regular signal core training, who were going through regular signal core training and knew nothing about our code. Some of them were very curious about our culture, and we figured we could at least share a little of our Navajo way with them. We got $20 from the camp athletic and morale officer to finance a ceremonial dance. We dressed in blankets and moccasins. We took off our, our, took off our Marine Corps caps and put headbands around our foreheads. Jimmy King, who was one of the best students in our class, played the drum as we danced. We sang the words of the writing song and the bluebird song as we circled about the camp. It was a good dance and entertained our white buddies. Some of them clapped their hands and tried to sing along with us. A few even tried to do some dance steps. Corporal Radin and a blonde Marine from Boston named John Smith among them, Smitty as everyone called him, had become one of my own special buddies and I shook his hand when he finished dancing. There was much laughter and many smiling faces that day. Our songs were lighthearted, for we knew that a time lay ahead of us when our hearts might be heavy. At the end of our program, we had a special surprise. Jimmy King had translated the Marine Corps hymn into Navajo, and we all sang it together. Just about everyone knows that song these days, but when we put it into Navajo, it came out a little differently. And then Hoki, the key, Anahila, we sang. Kalatsago, Nahalasike. That meant we have conquered all our enemies all over the world. The last verse was the furthest from the original song. We did not sing it, but chanted it together like a prayer. Kozogo, Nayalate, To, we began. May we live in peace hereafter. And we ended it this way. Salaga Soso. Do cha lakai, ya anasa go das des e, washinden b, akala b, kosila, hozo ga ke hatin. It meant if the army and the navy ever see heaven, the U.S. Marines will be there living in peace.